Hey everyone, welcome to Wildlife Inspired. I'm your host, Scott Keys, and today we're going to talk about the use of foreground in both wildlife and bird photography and how you can use it to enhance your images right after this. Now, I'm really excited about today's video on foregrounds. In this video, we're going to give you five reasons why you should think about incorporating foreground into your images for both wildlife or bird photography. And I'm really excited because I've enlisted Team Patreon. I've got my subscribers and they've submitted images to help reinforce these concepts. Back in the beginning of my photography, the idea was get it clean, get it neat, get it simple. Clean backgrounds, maybe a nice perch, bird unobscured. And as I've evolved in my photography, what I found is often that can start to become a little boring, a little plain. And so the, the idea of introducing more elements into a photo without necessarily being distracting was very, very appealing. And as I noticed, it, the introduction of foregrounds helped accomplish a lot of this. So I'm going to flip screens over in a minute and show you some images, but let's just talk about these five basic principles that I came up with that you can use to enhance your photography. The first reason for including foreground could be the enhancement of composition through things like framing or adding leading lines. Another dimension to this could be the use of color. So adding a second color or a third color to the image to really get a different look. Adding foreground can also increase the depth of an image. And we'll talk about that a little bit more in just a second. One of the ways I've enjoyed using foreground in my photography is actually the introduction of habitat. So you get a sense of where the subject belongs or where it's supposed to be. And I'm really excited to show you a few examples of putting a subject into context and then maybe also obscuring the subject a little bit, maybe adding a little mystery to it. And the final reason I use foreground in my photography and why you might want to consider is actually the removal of distractions or to help hide some things that may not be appealing in the images. Now, in addition to talking about the term foreground, you may hear a couple other terms, background, obviously, I think everybody knows what that is, or middle ground, or mid ground, as I call it. These are just layers of photography. And when we talk about the depth specifically, we'll be introducing these layers, and I'll show you some real live examples. But I'm ready to get started, so I'm going to switch screens, and we're actually going to show you some examples of using foreground to frame and enhance composition. Let's start with this first image by Crystal Migliori, and you can see that it's cl a clear example of using foreground to frame. In this case, we've got a nice little triangle formed by three branches. These branches, by the way, are a little bit harder or more in focus, so this is a hard framing. I'm going to contrast that in just a second with some softer framing. Now, let me just show you the difference between this harder framing, which works very well, by the way, and this softer framing. And it's just the distance between the foreground and the lens. So the closer the foreground is to the lens, the more blurred out, and it actually will appear to get larger as it goes. So it will get larger and more diffused. The further away that foreground is, it will actually start to regain its shape, and it will start to be a little bit more in focus. So it'll be harder. So again, the example between the sticks before, a little bit harder framing, and here a little bit softer framing. Uh, very important that you understand the idea of perspective. I've done a video on this. You can check that video out. But basically in this image, I was able to change my perspective to include those foreground elements and add a really nice rectangular or square shaped framing. Now, when it comes to composition, we're not just using foreground to frame. Sometimes we can add leading lines. This is an interesting topic around depth of field. So I just want to introduce this topic around leading lines and using foregrounds to lead to the subject. In this case, you'll notice the foreground is not super blurred out. So we don't have a narrow depth of field, we've got a wider depth of field. This allows you to actually see the road. So you could see how that road bends up and comes back to the deer. I wanted to include some non-bird images because this is a wildlife concept not specific to birds, but you can really see in this image how using a wider depth of field allows you to see the road and it runs right up to the deer. I think this is a really good example of using foreground to provide a leading line in composition, not just framing. Now, the second reason to include foreground in your wildlife photography could be the addition of color. This is an image by Cami Freed. And while it's a simple titmouse image on a perch with a gray background, there's not a lot of color in it without those foreground elements. So just adding a little pop of color, I thought this was a really neat idea. 
This looks like it could be some leaves or, or some sparse fall foliage. Maybe it's some new spring foliage, but it just gives you an indication that there's something else there. And I thought this introduction of color was really nice. Now there's two photographers I really like. It's a couple, Jason and Audrey, called the Bird Nerds on Instagram. They've provided a blue jay here with a really nice foreground over it. And I think this blue and yellow is a nice color. It's not necessarily complementary colors in terms of color theme, but I think it's a nice complement to each other. So I'm gonna show you this image. Again, very nice introduction of color. And then I'm gonna show you one that's a little more drastic. This is one of mine. Same color combination, blue and yellow, but in this case, a lot of foreground. Now, this can fall into a few different categories. I'm gonna put this one under color, but if this is a style you like, I think that this is something you could go out and experiment with. I wanna put this out there. There is no right or wrong in any photography. This will not work for everyone. There are some people who maybe traditionally or just the way they're wired are gonna like their, their photography cleaner. And if that's you, that's okay. I will tell you that, again, I've shared this before in my personal journey, the more I've gotten into this, the more interesting I find images like this, and the less interesting I find images where it's just really, really, really clean. Personal opinion. But in this video, we are gonna explore some of these uh, uh, concepts of being obscured, adding color, adding dimension, and adding depth. And being obscured is one of those concepts that's not gonna be for everybody. This is another image by Crystal Migliori. We're gonna get a little more dramatic with these colors. You can see my yellow and blue image. Here we've got blue and purple. This looks like either a young uh, blue jay or maybe a blue jay that's been defeathered a little bit. Um, and you could see the intro introduction of that, that new color, that purple in the foreground. Obscuring the subject again, but really I think adding a nice dimension to it. So I like this image uh, rather much. And I think it was a neat color to add to an image. We didn't see a lot of, we've seen some yellow so far. We're gonna see some more yellow in just a minute. We haven't seen any purple in these images yet. So I thought this was a really nice one. Now in this image, this is by Jonathan Smithies. And it's a little bit of a transition between color and depth. So color's pretty obvious in this. We've got a repetition of color, but I wanted to highlight this because it shows layers. It shows a foreground yellow, a midground or middle ground of also yellow, and a background of yellow. Just an, an interesting repetition of this color pattern, but in three very different ways. So I really, really like this. I thought it was a good transition as we kind of lead out into color. And we talk about the third concept, which is using foreground to create depth. Now, often with depth, you're gonna include both foreground and background. That's gonna give you that, that layering. And in this image, you can see that layering where the foreground is just obscuring the branch a little bit, not obscuring the bird. We've got the perch and the bird kind of in that middle ground, that focus area. And then you also see some leaves. Those leaves are serving to frame, but that's a background element. So you can see that foreground, midground, and background. I'm gonna show you another one here. This is by Elaine Dividetto. And this one shows a shorebird in context in its habitat, but notice the out of focus foreground, the very in focus bird, which now really stands out because there's nothing else in focus in this image. This is, is done, by the way, by, by lowering perspective. Uh, had this perspective been higher, the mid-ground may have included some of the ground below the bird. But by getting low and eye level, she does a great job of creating this out-of-focus foreground, putting the bird into these layers or this depth, and then you've got that out-of-focus background as well. So really nice job. The fourth benefit for me of including foreground in your photography is to give the subject a sense of habitat maybe where it belongs or what it's doing. This is by Ed Daly, a really great image. I thought this was really, really well done. You'll notice now in the past, we've shown a lot of soft out of focus foregrounds, but that doesn't always need to be the case. And here we've got a case where the foreground is a, an integral part of the image and it actually shows what the subject's doing. In this case, eating. Uh, I really like this. And by the way, the leaves are really well placed as they also tend to frame the face of the subject, not the whole subject, but they kind of frame the face. Really nice job by Ed on that one. Sometimes we use foreground to show the subject in its native habitat or in its natural habitat. This image by Krista Chappelle is a really great example of that. You see the framing, but I want you to pay attention to two foreground elements. One is that soft out of focus area on the right side of the frame. On the left side of the frame, you will see an in-focus but still foreground element. 
This is a, a yellow warbler and it's it's a great habitat for them. They like these, sh these shorter trees. They like to forage in fruit trees. And this is a really, really perfect example. This is where the bird lives. And the foreground here tells a great story while also providing a little bit of framing. We'll get into this concept also of, of hiding and obscuring a subject. We'll get to that in a minute, but this, this photo actually contains a few elements. I really thought it did a great job of presenting and showing a subject in its true habitat. And speaking of true habitats, it doesn't have to be a bird. Uh, this is a rabbit, very, very soft. So the rabbit looks like it's pretty close to the, the lens and you see this really soft foreground. It gives it a sense that it's ensconced in grass, which is where a rabbit should be. So I thought this image by Jerry Ramsey was a terrific example of putting a, uh, a non-bird subject into habitat that feels really, really right for it. And when it comes to putting a subject into its habitat, I want you to notice a difference. I'm going to show you two images. Now these are of mine. And in each image, you get a sense of the subject in its habitat. The scale of the subject to habitat, the ratio is about similar, but I'm going to show you two different looks and I'll toggle back and forth. In the first one, we're actually using the foreground to show that habitat. So you get a sense of the colors and the field and the meadow. Now this would probably still be a pretty image without the foreground elements, but adding those foreground elements, I think, provided some more color. In the second image, about the same proportions of subject to, to scale, you could see that this field sparrow doesn't have any foreground elements or at least nothing in terms of color. And here I'm using the background to create that. Now that's a different video for a different day, but I want you to, I'm going to toggle back and forth and notice how the same effect is achieved but using two different elements. The first element here, or the element here, using background to provide context and habitat. And then here, doing the exact same thing with foreground. And I wanted to show this because I think we normally think of background as providing the habitat or the context of where something is or where it lives. But in this case, you can see that that, that same effect can be achieved through the use of foreground. So I thought that was a really good example. And when it comes to habitat, you can use foreground to obscure or hide, even play some games with this idea of, of peeking around corners or, or coming around the outside. This is a yellow-breasted chat by Cami Freed. Really, really lovely image. I love these leaves and I just, I just like that look, that inquisitive look. You can feel it. Just really, really, really wonderfully done. Uh, I like the framing, it almost looks like drapes or curtains kind of hanging down in this chat, just peeking around the corner at the camera. I think this is also very engaging. So these, these peekaboo scenes, they, they create a lot of engagement often and, and a little bit of mystery. So really, really well done. So we're not always putting the subject in habitat to show where it lives. Sometimes we're using these foreground elements to obscure or hide or play a little bit of mystery with it. I've got one more here. In that same vein, this by Krista Chappelle is a Blackburnian warbler. It looks like it's hiding, I think it's hiding behind a native dogwood tree, which really excites me. Um, I, I love this. I just absolutely love it. Again, for a lot of people, this softer feel, the softer light, the softer foreground might not be your style. Maybe a bird being obscured isn't your style, but I will tell you, uh, for me personally, I really love it. And I would challenge you, if you've never done this type of photography, to just play around with it. You may find that you don't like it, but you just might find that you do. So play around with that. Now, the last reason I've listed for using foreground in photography is to obscure or remove distractions. Now, this is an image by Ed Daly. It's a peregrine falcon. The, it, by the way, looks fantastic large. I wish you guys could see this large. The details on the head are incredible. For a lot of people, this is going to get a little uncomfortable. I talked about when you, when you bring a foreground element really close to the lens, it, it gets distorted. It gets bigger in terms of scale. It gets bigger in the lens and it gets blurry and softer. You can actually sometimes see through the edges of leaves if they're really, really close, but it's going to obscure it. It's going to, it's going to remove the detail and it's going to add some color. So in this image, the top quarter, the top left quarter is unobscured. But whatever that foreground element is, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to guess it's leaves. It's blurring the entire right side and the entire bottom. So three quarters of this image is obscured by foreground, but it's incredibly soft. Now, what are the advantages of doing this? 
The advantage is that in camera, without having to go into Photoshop and remove branches at the bottom, you can see there's a branch hanging out on the left. You can see there's a, a, a stick or a snag hanging out on the right. Those two elements aren't particularly appealing. In fact, with a little bit of sun, those elements will get hot, meaning they'll get bright and they'll be distracting. You can use foreground to actually cut down those elements and minimize that. So while this foreground is in a lot of ways interesting and, and it's a lot, it's actually serving a purpose, which is to obscure and help remove. Now, I can't tell you what was in Ed's head when he shot this other than probably trying something a little different and trying to include some foreground and maybe add some framing. When the framing is this soft, it often doesn't feel like framing, but it can serve the purpose of removing distractions or, or at least helping to obscure them. I've got a really good image or example of this in just a second um, where I can walk you through my actual thought process out in the field. So stay tuned for that. I've got another image here. This is a yellow rumped warbler by, or is it a palm warbler by Kelly Soranko. And um, one of the things about this, one reason I wanted to include this is you can see that foreground on the, on the left. So it's some leaves kind of hanging down. When we talk about obscuring, sometimes it adds interest by taking away something else. So the, the perch there, that, that bare stick, getting some light, it's, it's not really, it's not the most appealing perch in the world. It's not super interesting. Now, to me, that green is a lot more interesting. It's a, it's a pretty color. So by, by bringing that into the frame, to me, it, it does frame it softly, but it also just obscures that stick a little bit more, kind of gets it out of the way. And look at where my focus goes. Instead of going to the bright area of the stick, my focus naturally wants to go to the bird. In fact, I will tell you that if I had more foreground over there, it'd be even better. If there was another leaf over there, this isn't photoshopped. So yeah, you could probably photoshop some stuff in there and, and cover it up a little bit more, but this is out of camera. And I just thought it was really, really well done. So Kelly, nice job on including some elements to help minimize maybe the brighter areas of that branch, a part of the frame, which, which probably wasn't super interesting to begin with. By the way, she could have cropped this down even more. I don't know how many pixels were available, but we could have cropped it right to the edge of that framing element, that foreground. And that might've made a nice composition as well. Bird nerds back. This is a, a chickadee. This could fall into a different, a couple different categories, but I like the use of this foreground. It added some color, but what I really like is this concept of hiding the perch, which may not have been good on its own. So it, it just added a dimension. It added an element. Remember, the distance from the lens will affect how blurred out that is. This is in a nice distance because it feels like a flower. You can recognize it very easily, but it's not really in focus and distracting. So it's, it's kind of got this soft feel to it. So really nice job using this, I'm going to call it a sunflower, I assume it is, um, to help cover a perch, which may not have been appealing. And now I'm going to walk you through just a day in the field with me. I can remember this day because it was one of the times where I was very intentionally trying to include foreground, not for the purpose of adding color, not for the purpose of showing habitat or framing. I was actually using this to cut out light, meaning I, the light was starting to get a little stronger. This is what the light looked like. It was getting strong. It's not, it's not super strong yet, but it's getting there. I just want you to notice right behind the bird, there's some leaves that are in focus and they're, they're kind of bright, right? You see that. So what I did is I, I got this bird to on a perch, he was just, uh, by the way, indigo buntings are really, really nice subjects because they tend to sing. They tend to hang out low and sing. So if you can get them eye level, they'll stay there for a little bit. Now, I want you to pay attention to a couple things with this image. It might, you might miss it at first. There's a large area out of focus. This is raw file, this is untouched, unedited, just completely raw. Down on the bottom right, you'll see this foreground covering it. And what I was trying to do is the bird wasn't on a great perch. And you look at the perch, it's just a snag. It's just a dead stick. So I thought, can I cover it up? So I tried to move so I could get some of that foreground to help minimize the frame, minimize the perch, and also cut down some of the light because the light was starting to get strong. Look at the top. You're going to see more foreground. There's actually some foreground hanging there. So I'm really working to get as much foreground into this as possible with the idea that if I can blur out the top with foreground and blur out the bottom with foreground, and minimize some of those annoying things, maybe I can get an image out of this. The final image looks like this. May not be your style. I get that. Might not be your style. A lot of this is foreground. That bottom, that bottom third, right third is all foreground. There's some foreground at the top. You can't even really see it. 
blends into the background and the bird just really, really pops in this field of color. Again, it isn't everybody's style, but if you like this style, if this, if this is appealing to you, then I will tell you that, that using foreground can be very, very interesting and it has a lot of purposes. And with that said, let me show you my two favorite images from the set that I received today. This first one is by Mark Troxell. I'll show it up on the screen here a little bit differently than the others. I just want you to notice a couple things about this. We talked about framing and you could see how nicely just the color frames it. So this would be that soft framing as opposed to that hard framing. And then also the introduction of color or the repetition of color. So you could see that the, the subject is feeding on some purple flowers or violet flowers. And then you've got that same color mirrored in the foreground to frame it. Now I gotta tell you, this one is really, really good to me. I, I wanna congratulate Mark for an image that I thought was just really outstanding. It's not going to be for everyone. I've made that point several times, but man, when it works and you play around with it and you get it just right, you get an image like this, which I think just has so much more, so much more interest than if it was just the hummingbird feeding on the plant. So great job, Mark. And maybe my favorite image of the entire set is this image by Libby Foster. This is a dick sisal and it's perched in what I think is cup plant, if I've got the native plant right. And it is just perfect. The framing is outstanding. The, the feel is soft, but you know where it's at. These are birds that live in grasslands and live in meadows, so the context feels right. So this has exceptional composition. It's got beautiful color. It's got nice depth because you see some foreground and some background. It puts the bird in habitat. It really checks a lot of boxes for this video. And I thought this final image just really illustrated how wonderful something can be when it's well done and it incorporates foreground for a lot of reasons. One of the small tiny details on this that I really love, uh, lures on birds are these little areas over the eye and dick sissels have this little tiny yellow lure there. And wouldn't you know that's the color of the flowers as well. So you get that sense that there's some uh, repetition in the color. The subject has this hint of yellow which is then reflected in this whole very soft very beautiful image. Libby, I'm so proud of you. Um, I really love this image and I'd love to read the comments down below and see a few people that just recognize how beautiful many of these images are. So that's my video for you today on foreground. I hope you found it interesting. Thanks again to all of my patrons, but especially for those that contributed to this video. And I'm glad I was able to include you in it. You provided me with some wonderful examples. So thank you for your support on the channel, for watching the video, thank you. And as always, I hope we can continue to find inspiration in wildlife together.